today I'm here with Roger Savory, project lead for Deserts to Grasslands, Feeding the Future. Cool. Welcome. Thanks for coming on to this podcast. Thanks, thanks, Alpha. I'm happy to be here. Cool. Um, do you want to share a little bit about your background? Um, you, you did a lot of work in Africa, right, with restoration and water. Um, so, well, firstly, if you look at my passport, I've worked in 64 countries. Wow. So, um, so I have been around the block once or twice. Um, I, uh, I got born into holistic management through osmosis because my father, Alan Savory, is kind of the founder of the entire movement. Um, which is um, kind of morphed into the regenerative agricultural uh, movement. Um, and so I um, ranched in America, Canada, Australia, uh, Africa. Um, so I've always been one of the unusual consultants from the point of view, I've always been an owner and an operator plus a consultant. Most consultants only consult and it's book knowledge. I've got the practical knowledge as well as the book knowledge. Um, and while my father worked on policy and figuring out mechanisms to get this knowledge um, into, um, into the world, I left that for him to do. I was the kind of the grunt on the ground managing the Africa Center for Holistic Management's ranches, man managing my own ranches and stuff. And I left, when I left that um, NGO kind of work, um, then I went, okay, if Alan is working on those problems and my sister is working on those problems, what can I work on that with my unique skill sets that no, you know, no one else has worked on? And call it a big ego, a small ego, a megalomaniac's ego, I don't know. But I looked around and I said, well, what's the toughest pro problem that man has never solved? And uh, I've, I've got six degrees all wrapped up into one. And um, so I've got a very varied education. Um, and based on that, I went, the greatest problem facing humanity is the exponential spread of deserts around the world. And you can read back into biblical times, Babylon, the Hanging Gardens, the land of milk and honey, um, Canaan. You can read throughout all the historical texts about how abundant life was. And then once the desertification started, we've never been able to stop it. And where we created deserts, whether it was 10,000 years ago or 15,000 years ago or 250,000 years ago, that's the oldest records I can find. Wherever humans have created deserts, we've never been, un been able to undo desertification. So I went, okay, that's the biggest problem. If I can crack that, then... Um, I believe there's hope for humanity. Um, so whilst doing my ranching, whilst doing my consulting, my pet project in the background has just been rabid looking for information and knowledge um, for how to solve what I consider human's largest problem. You know, and you know, climate change and biodiversity loss and all of these are symptoms of us creating bigger and bigger deserts around the world and then having smaller land masses to support more humans. So, so that's what I've concentrated on. And I had my first success in Zimbabwe. Then I had successes in America, then Canada, then Australia. And after 25, 30 years of research, I realized that I had, I had discovered it. I had figured it out. And when I tried certain things, no matter where in the world I tried them, it was like gravity. I'd figured out the principles of what caused the desert and how to solve it. Um, and so now I'm just trying to get that knowledge out and do bigger projects. You know, uh, solving a couple of hundred acres uh, is, is not going to solve the world's problems, but solving it on at the millions of acres scale, that I think will have an impact on, on humanity. So... The Deserts to Grasslands Feeding the uh, Future project um, morphed out of several other projects I tried to get established. And I connected it to the X Prize um, because that was, you know, perfect publicity. So we entered a team for the X Prize. And basically the plan is to turn 150,000 acres a year of pure desert, blowing sand, back into usable functioning biodiverse ecosystems with functioning carbon cycles, functioning micro water cycles, functioning uh, nutrient cycles, 
basically bring life back to the deserts. Um, I've spent 30 years figuring out how to do it, and I, I think we can do it on scale. Now what's preventing us doing it is humans just don't believe it can be done. For 10,000 years, our entire collective knowledge base is we create deserts and we, we plunder and go and move on. You know, slash, burn agriculture, plowing, sterilize soils, run out of nutrients. Okay, go and attack the next village, take their land, do it over again. Um, and so we, we no longer have that option. The, the planet is getting too big and nuclear bombs have stopped real war. So we now have to fix what we've broken. And in America, it's, there's about 200 million acres of land at risk and we've already turned 81 million acres according to the USDA into pure blowing sand desert. So if we could start with over the next 20 years, just fixing 20 million acres, I think we will show the world and America that we can repair the damage that our ancestors have done. And this is our collective ancestors. It doesn't matter whether you're Native American, Eskimo, Asian, this is globally. Humans have done this for millions of years. Um, and, and so, and it was due to a faulty wiring system in our brains. And now that we understand what we were doing wrong, we have the potential to fix it. But now we've got to get humans over our instinctual fear of the unknown um, and to accept that we can actually fix it um, and then put resources towards doing it. And I put my finger up at the back of the classroom and I said, hey, give me a chance. Let me try. Let me show you what can be done. And let's scale the smaller projects that I've already done um, to to a size that will actually have an impact and actually help humanity. Short answer. Great. Well, I'm super excited about this whole uh, idea of regreening the deserts. Um, do you want to start by just sharing a little bit some of the small experiments you did? I, I assume they were done in Zimbabwe. Is that right? Some of the um, so the first experiments I did um, on my ranch in, in Zambia, and then uh, and and they weren't really badly desertified. It was just poor land, you know, gullies and and poor soil. And and we have a nine month hot dry season. You know, it gets to 120 in the shade in October. Um, it's miserable. Um, and uh, and then we have three months of rainy season. So in the what we call the brittle environments, we have a wet season and a dry season. That's where the spread of deserts has been more profound. Um, and so I, I kind of put some ideas together and, and I did some literally some 100 meter by 100 meter plots on my ranch using my own 2000 cattle. Um, and I saw how uh, we actually grew corn um, on the plots once I'd fixed them, uh, corn and potatoes, and I saw the long-term benefits of just getting cow manure on top of the soil, and that was nearly 30 years ago, and that was the beginning, and then I went down to Zimbabwe, and I said, and it was even worse in Zimbabwe than in, on my ranch, so, I, so we started um, doing the biological carpeting kind of like a caterpillar creeping across the land. And we made the, and I'd learned that there was a time factor. If I left the animals in one place for too long, we didn't have the response. If I left them there too little, we didn't have the response. There was an exact right amount of time. And that was about 13 years of experiments, you know, cause every year you do it and you say, okay, now let's wait a year and see the results. <laughs> it's very frustrating. You do a week of experiment and you literally have to wait a year to see the results. Um, and uh, and so the, so you do the one trial and another trial and well let's try this and let's try that and and over about thirteen years I figured out what what were the key ingredients um, and um, and then oh you know, it was probably twenty five years into the experiments that the penny finally dropped and I understood what I had accidentally been doing I kind of felt like a druid who believes you know you know in you know magic because you can't see what these tiny microorganisms are doing. But uh, as soon as you figure it out, then you go, okay, this is what they require for their life cycle. If we can protect them in their life cycle, then, then we get things going. And what I finally realized the enemy is ultraviolet light. Um, and cut through all the nonsense, all the mumbo jumbo, all the high you know, you know, fancy pants stuff. If we can protect the microorganisms living on the top one millimeter of sand from ultraviolet light and heat, we can build soils anywhere. And it's as simple as that. 
Um, so once we've got the ultraviolet light taken care of, then by default, we get the heat taken care of. When we've got the ultraviolet light and the heat taken care of, then light can start building. And you, you know, everyone remembers that bacteria divide every 10 minutes. So the process of them building and multiplying and growing is very fast once we can get them to live. But ultraviolet light kills them instantly. So you've got to have this solid carpet of biomass. And I mean solid, there can be no gaps, none. And when you can get a solid carpet to prevent ultraviolet light getting through to that top one millimeter of sand, that's when we just see things take off. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so over 13 years, I figured out, you know, number of cattle per square meter, amount of time, you know, there was so much mathematics to figuring out exactly how to get that biological carpet just right. But the basic principle is all we're trying to do is defeat heat and ultraviolet light. And I've come up with a formula for how many cattle, what feed they've got to have to do it. Once that ultraviolet light is taken care of, then the bacteria and the fungi can get established, you know, mycorrhizae fungi. Everybody knows uh, funguses need warm, wet, and dark. Well, where do you find warm, wet, and dark in the sands of the desert? It just doesn't exist. So unless we can give warm, wet, and dark conditions for fungi networks to get established, we have no hope of creating soils in the desert. And that's why covering sand with plastic, or if you see all these organic farms, they roll out plastic, you know, and then plant their plant. It has no hope of um, working. It actually kills the soil microorganisms, creates too much heat. It's got no food source. You know, so we have to use nature because nature evolved for, for itself. So, so, yeah, that's as simple as it is, but it's something that evaded man for over 10,000 years. And I'm not saying that someone else didn't figure this out 4,000 years ago, but he didn't have the power of the internet to spread the message around the world. Yeah, so I, I hope we can break through. Um, but uh, just miraculous uh, examples wherever we have done it, whether it was you know, in the you know, heat of the Australian outback, whether it was in Africa, where, you know, um, uh, we've done it up at nine and a half thousand feet in an, in a high alpine you know desert in Colorado where they only have sixty days of growing. Um, you know we've I've I've moved around the the world trying to find somewhere where it won't work and I I can't find the place. Could you say a little bit about some of your early experiments? Which animals and microorganisms did you use, and what was it that led you to stumble upon the the, the ultraviolet um, idea? So we can blame San Diego and a bar for the ultraviolet idea um, because I had a civil engineer woman just keep asking me questions about, well, why and why and why and why? She was very annoying, but she forced me to think. Um, and I kept drilling deeper and she said, well, why is that? And, and I drilled deeper and well, why? And then finally I went, oh my God, that's what it is. It's the ultraviolet light. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I chased many um, uh, dead ends. You know, uh, in one of uh, my biological carpets, we noticed that the sheep and goat pellets, the most grass grew in those. So we thought, oh, maybe it's the urine and the, and the you know, whatever's in a sheep and goat pellet. And uh, for two or three years, I was chasing the sheep and goat pellets um, as, as, the, as the silver bullet. And then one day we had a four inch rainfall and the sheep and goat pellets all lifted off the ground and went brrr, floating down river and the soil was bare. So I went, whoops, that's not the solution. Um, then, you know, so then we, you know, we realized that the cow patties locked onto the ground like a plate. Um, so then, you know, we tried, okay, well, let's put sheep and goats with cows. So that those pellets, you know, um, you know, uh, get pushed in and held in place by the cow patties. But I was just chasing. I was chasing. I was chasing my limited knowledge, um, and uh, you know. Then I realized no, it had. It, it made no difference because it had nothing to do with the cow manure, and it had nothing to do with the sheep manure. They literally are unimportant. It's the bacteria and the fungi that build soil, not cow manure or sheep manure. 
And that's what we didn't understand. You know, so if you look at what happens in American dairies, um, they take the cow ship and they go and spread it out on the fields and they see no, no benefit because it's not the cow manure that's the benefit. It's the process. And the process is how do you create a safe environment for microorganisms and, and fungi spores? That's the key. So, uh, so, you know, but, you know, I, I, I'm persistent. I did a lot of experiments and, you know, trying to figure these things out. And, you know, we, we do see fantastic results from chicken manure, turkey manure, cow manure, sheep manure, goat manure. But those are, if, if you think about it like this, um, a microorganism needs to live in liquid. As soon as the cow patty dies out or the sheep pellet dies out, uh, dries out, where is the liquid? How does the microorganism live in it? And the answer is it can't and it doesn't. Now, if you think about a microorganism that's a nanometer big, where can it actually get energy from? Well, it can get energy or nutrients from the urine of an animal, but not from the dung. So the urine was more important than the dung. But that's only good for a few minutes until the urine evaporates and dries up. You see, so now you have to have the dung preventing the urine evaporating. Well, if you just got one dung paddy in a field, the wind and sun around it dries out almost instantly. But when you've got so many paddies that they glue together in a solid mat, well, now you don't, it, you know, the wind can't blow around them and cause this instant evaporation. So there were so many pieces of this puzzle that I had to figure out that now in hindsight, it all seems oh, so logical. But for many years, it was, I think that's why I'm bald. You know, for many years, it was like, what the hell happened here? Why didn't this work? What went wrong? You know, and now, now I can say consistently, I, 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 you know, I, now I get success whenever I do it now because I've figured out all the pieces of the puzzle. Um, so urine is more important than the dung for feeding a microorganism, but urine is no good without the dung. Um, and, and it's all got to come together and it's these densities and it's time, too much time, you know, also does damage. Yeah. You know, so if you try and put the dung there over a too long a period, it has a compacting effect and it overcompacts the soil. Um, so it's got to be a lot of dung deposited in a short period of time, you know, and then, and then move on. So, yeah, you know, we're talking about herds of 150,000 cattle, you know, kind of just creeping forward daily, you know, leaving, leaving a pile of shit behind them. But now if a pile of shit is four inches high, which is, you know, often they hit the ground four to six inches high, any gardener in the world will tell you that a four inch pile of, uh, of uh, mulch will stop seeds germinating and growing through it. So then we had to figure out, okay, well, how do we get it all evenly spread out across the ground? And we found that there's this miracle tool that gives us eggs and meat um, that does the job. It's called the chicken. So now while the chickens were in scratching through the dung looking for fly maggots, they were spreading the dung out nice and evenly. So the chickens are now part of the, the thing. So you know, we, start, we start trying to save the life of a microorganism. Now we've added a cow. Now we've added a chicken. You know, now we get a meat product out of the cow and a you know, meat product you know, and an egg product out of the chicken. Um, and uh, yeah, so already we're getting a return on our investment while trying to turn a desert back into a grassland. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as things start to germinate and grow, well, now the micro water cycle gets fixed. And that is what humans have just never understood. We didn't even know it existed. I think I'm the one who coined the term micro water cycle. You know, people talk about the little water cycle and the big water cycle. I think I'm the one who started calling it the micro because it is at a vapor size. It is micro. Um, and what I found was once we fix the micro water cycle, life really takes off. You know, and that was what humans had fundamentally failed to understand and know the power of. Um, and I think it's the micro water cycle that creates our rainstorms. I think it's micro water cycle that brings life. I'm sweating here in the micro water cycle in Florida. Um, you know, it's this humidity in the air that is vital for, for life. 
Can you define what the micro water cycle is? Um, so uh, basically it's water vapor. So it's water in the form of vapor. It hasn't got to the size of a droplet yet. So as long as water is still vapor, it's part of the micro water cycle. And water vapor can be absorbed by plants. It can be absorbed by animals through their skin. Um, whereas water is too big and is not absorbed. So it's the water vapor um, that is actually vital for life. So you're saying the micro water cycle is when uh, the soil or the plants evapotranspire and then it gets absorbed back in through the leaves or through the soil? Well, uh, so that's the most obvious part of it. But I, I mean, the, the, um, the, the fungi are, are giving off vapor, the composting uh, process, uh, the, anaer the, the, the aerobic and anaerobic, uh, mostly the aerobic bacteria are giving it off. Um, it's, it is, it's, the it's the moisture that leaves the cell of a living organism. And it doesn't matter wh what it is, whether it's a fungi, a bacteria, a rat, a human, a cow. It is the, it, it's, it's literally vapor. It's, it's the size of a water molecule that can leave a living cell. So it can get out of the cell membrane and be released. And we paid no attention to it. And it's, it is what life, you know, we know we're 88 or 88% 88 water or whatever we are. Um, and, you know, we know we have to drink, um, but, you know, it, there's so much stuff to the water vapor. For, for example, do you know that there are herds of cows that have never had a drink of water in their life? No. Yeah. Um, so you go, how is that possible? And then you, uh, and then there's research that shows that a cattle herd that if it's given highly oxygenated water will gain 10% more weight than cattle who drink just regular standing water. So if they drink water from a trough that's bubbling, you know, like a goldfish bowl, um, then they gain 10% more weight. So then you have to back out and look at the hole and go, well, what's going on here? And then you look at the cow and you realize that cows don't actually eat grass. And you go, hold on, but cows do eat grass. No, they don't. Cows eat the microorganisms in their intestine. They harvest forage to feed those microorganisms. And so they harvest about 5% lignin, which is the, the tough fibers in grass. And the, the rest is a balance of protein and carbohydrate, mostly coming from legumes and broadleaves. So, okay, so cows don't eat grass. They collect forage for the microorganisms. Well, then you ask the question, well, what do those microorganisms need? Well, they need oxygen to help process these carbohydrates and, and protein molecules. Well, what's the source of oxygen in a cow's stomach? They breathe through their nose, fill up their lungs, and the oxygen goes to their blood system. But there's no blood in the stomach lining. So how do the microorganisms in the stomach get oxygen? Well, quite simply, H2O. They drink water, not for water. They drink water for oxygen. And you can imagine that a micro element of H2O has much around it to connect for the microorganisms to utilize and absorb. So this has been our fundamental, and I'm talking all humans throughout history, have failed to understand the significance of the micro, uh, the micro water cycle. And you know, we can see it for ourselves when you go into a jungle, a non brittle environment. You can see the water vapor in the air. We never connected the dots. Well, on our regenerative agricultural ranches, when we're fixing the pastures and we're getting them full of biodiversity, all the ranchers are reporting this incredible mist uh, or, or fog early in the mornings and how there's this moisture in the plants. And they're saying, we haven't had rain in two months and our grass is wet every morning because of this, you know, there's this micro ecosystem and this micro water cycle that's functioning. And uh, so I wish more people would get to see it, but that as scientists has got to be our goal to encourage all farmers and ranchers around the world, especially in the brittle environments where there's nine months of no rain, 
to make every decision possible to fix the micro water cycle. So, 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 so usually we think of microorganisms getting water from the rain, but you're saying it's actually really coming from the micro water cycle. It's like evapotranspiring yeah. from maybe stored in the soil somewhere on the dung or the urine, and then it evapotranspires yeah. and transports elsewhere. So that's, that's yeah. the distribution mechanism of the water. Yeah, and if you look in a grassland, because they're quite low, you know, they're you know, maybe 6, 12 feet high compared to a tree canopy of 70, 80. Um, when you dig yourself into a functioning uh, grassland ecosystem, when you dig under, it, it's steamy in there. There's mm. this whole, it, I mean, it's, it's tropical. It's like a jungle in there. Okay. Um, yeah, and I just want some of the listeners, uh, so there's a distinguishment here between the small water cycle, which is where the water goes all the way up, forms clouds, and then forms rain. That's a small water cycle, what you call the little water cycle. But then there's also the micro water cycle, which is more yeah. this mist and dew that forms. Um, yeah, form. exactly. Um, so when you were in Zimbabwe, so some of the initial experiments you had were like cows and chickens and creating this biological carpet, you say, of dung and, and urine. Yeah. And that's when you discovered that the land would start regenerating. Like you, had, What kind of state was the land in and how did it regenerate as you did this? Um, so if you ever watched Alan Savory's TED Talk, uh, a long time ago. Kind of yep. So in 2013. So uh, in that way, he shows the images of the bare red soil. And then uh, you know, a few years later, it's totally covered in grass. Those were some of my first biological carpeting experiments um, in that environment. Uh, aside from what I did on my ranch in Zambia, which was more, I would you know, plant crops on it. Mm. Could you give a different, diff how, how do you, would you define biological carpet? Like what animals, what what state, like is there a particular composition? Like how would you describe um, uh, So basically uh, it's a carpet of uh, biomass created by a grazing animal that's at least an inch thick covering every square millimeter of soil. Okay. It's literally just you know, biological matter mm -hmm. that's been through the intestine of a grazing animal. And, and we found we had to do that when we tried to do it with mulch, we didn't have the same effect. Because remember the intestine is full of billions of microorganisms. So they are intrinsically in the dung when it hits the ground. Mm. So that's your spores, that's your, you know, that's your amoebas, that's your beginning of life. They're stored in it and then it hits the ground. So um, yeah, whenever we tried it with mulch and tried to do it mechanically, we just didn't have the same not so, even close to the same. It's effect. a combination of the fungi mycelia with the kind of bacteria. And that, that combination is what's yeah. starting to build the soil. And they're using matter from the dung in addition. It, yeah, yeah. So the, the matter from the dung is a tiny bit. And I really mean it's a tiny bit. Um, mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, but if you think about it, we're talking about building the soil in, in a one millimeter strip. That's this tiny little strip. And once that's done, then that life supports the, the life in the second millimeter. And once mm -hmm. that's done, then the third millimeter. And basically, as soon as the plants, as soon as uh, the fungi tap the plant seeds and tell them it's time to germinate and they germinate, well, now you have a leaf coming up through the biological carpet. The leaf then photosynthesizes it, harvests energy, C3 and C4 sugars, uh, carbon C3 and C4, harvests those sugars and it pumps them underground. And as soon as it starts pumping underground, well, now more life can live because all life needs energy to live. And without photosynthesis, all that life below the biological carpet cannot live. So the carpet is the first bit to stabilize, protect from heat, protect from ultraviolet light. Then once the mycelial network is established, it then triggers the seeds to germinate. A seed will not germinate Unless a mycelium caps it on the, you know, on the, you know, seed, um, and says time to germinate. There's a symbiotic relationship. So seeds without any mycelium, you know, you know, won't germinate, and then with the mycelium they will germinate. Now farmers have known this for a long time. That's why you, you know, when you buy legume seeds, you have to buy uh, what is it called? There's a word for it in farming. Um, uh, Anyway, yeah, farmers have known for a long time, you buy inoculant, that's what it is. So you buy a mycelium inoculant to mix with your seeds before you put them in the ground. 
Mm. Um, you know, we've known for a long time that, you know, there is a symbiotic relationship. But across the deserts of the world, you know, those mycelium have been dead for five, 10,000 years, 100 years, 200 years. Pick a date. They've been, you know, blowing sand has not had fungus in it for a long, 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 long time. Mm. So now remember, there are billions of fungi spores in the air. So when those fungi spores are blowing through the air currents and they land on the biological carpet, they find a home that they can go, oh, it's safe, we can germinate and grow here. So there's a whole, is so much complexity all coming together. So you know, I don't fully understand the complexity. I don't think any human ever will understand the complexity. All I've tried to figure out is, okay, if we do this, this, and this, will we get that result consistently? Because, you know, in science, if you can't repeat an experiment, it's not valid. Well, I've repeated this, you know, on one, two, you know, at least three continents, uh, several different altitudes, you know, several different dryness factors. It's repeatable now. Um, so I, I think I've figured it out with enough detail, even though I don't understand it all, so that the scientific community can accept, okay, this is like gravity. If we do this, we'll get that response. If you throw an apple in New York or one in Australia, it will hit the ground. If you put a biological carpet on desert sand in Arabia, in America, in Africa, in Australia, we will get life returning. Mm. It's that simple. So could you describe one of these experiments where you put it on desert sand? How long did it take to turn from sand to soil? So I do like to boast here because mm. my record was six weeks. Oh, wow. Where was that? That was in Zimbabwe, and it was just a, it was just a whole bunch of things came together. Mm -hmm. So we did the biological carpet one week before the October rain started. Wow. And how big of a plot was that? 100 meters by 100 meters. Okay. Wow. That's pretty impressive. Um, so the, the rains came, and then um, the dung beetles buried all the dung, and then a... I, I, I don't know how many, but I'm guessing over 10,000 different uh, mushrooms uh, germinated and started growing. And then the mushrooms all uh, sh uh, shriveled up and died. And then like a chia pet of new grasses started growing. Mm. Um, and six weeks later, we had uh, shoulder high grass. Wow. On a, on a piece of land that before we put the biological carpet down was bare soil and shale. Mm. I mean, it was rock. There, there was nothing for topsoil. So, yeah, that, that's been the most impressive one. But like I said, the timing was right. If I'd put that same biological carpet down four months earlier, I would have had to wait for those first rains. Okay. And did you say um, that at that some point in, like in certain African places, you've seen as the degraded lands will return um, to, to more vibrant soil, that rains also were affected? Is that... Some of yeah. So, yeah. So what, what we do know is that when you have a healthy functioning micro water cycle and you have the fungi and you have the fungi releasing spores into the atmosphere, the spores bind with uh, water vapor molecules and create bigger ones and you have increased rainfall. So there's some, uh, so there's two places that have recorded on the globe where when vegetation grew, rainfall increased. The one is the sappy forests of South Africa. When they planted uh, their timber all over the grasslands, there's a known scientific increase in rainfall that occurred once the forests grew. There's another one in Brazil where when the farm was bare, everything dried up. When they planted the trees back, the rains returned and the river started flowing again. There is um, uh, uh, Dr. Ian, Ian, Ian Garland in South Africa. Uh, planted trees, got a estuary working again, fixed the whole riparian area just by planting trees. Then as far as the grasslands go, the American Midwest, in the spring of each year now, it's much drier than historical records because they plow all the land bare and they plant corn. But in the late summer, when that corn is six, eight, ten feet tall, the historical records are now showing that the late summer has much more rainfall. So they've got drier springs because the soil is bare and much wetter late summers. Um, so, you know, so there is a direct correlation. We do know that you increase biomass, 
evapotranspiration, we increase rainfall. And in the African ones, uh, how big was these uh, plots of land that they saw that was? Um, so in Africa, we fixed about 5,000 acres um, and it was definitely more moisture on the one side of the highway that we fixed than on the other side. Mm. Yeah, wow. people used to say, yeah, it was quite funny. Ah, it only rains on your property. That's why we've got a drought. And we were like, yeah, but six years ago, we looked like you and we fixed ours. Now you can do the same and your, your drought will end. And were you able to convince neighbors of that? <laughs> they are being convinced slowly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, there, there's, and that's why we're having such a problem launching our deserts to grassland feeding the future project is humans are so skeptical um, that they take uh, basically 14 to 15 years to accept a new idea at a minimum. Uh, basically, you have to be a child when you hear it, and when you become an adult, you'll accept it. But an adult won't accept something that he hears as an adult if it goes against his belief system. Right. Yeah. So, um, so uh, let's turn a little bit of our attention to California because you're proposing some projects there. I know Joshua Tree. Um, it now is kind of a desert in Joshua Tree, but actually in the 1950s. Um, it was actually more grassland and uh, because I think it was, there was a lot of mining operations. I don't know, maybe that's the reason because they somehow degraded the water there. And so that that area in Joshua Tree is now just more desert. And so it's expanding in, in California. Sometimes we think that there's less rain there just because of the mountains, but actually it's also the human activity that's creating these deserts and expanding them. Well, so uh, the whole piece of land behind the mountain range between the coast and the, the inland desert is fascinating. Um, if you go and wander out there as much as I have, you'll find barbed wire fences where just the top strand of wire is sticking out of the sand. Okay, now barbed wire was invented in what, 1866? Okay. So, and it was an expensive product. Now, why would you put a five strand barbed wire fence across a desert if there was no forage? You wouldn't have, it's illogical. Okay, so it shows that around 1866, there was enough grassland and enough livestock there to make it economically feasible and economically viable to run a five strand barbed wire fence, the latest in technology in 1866, across those what we now call deserts. But if you look at the records, um, there was the 100 year flood. And I don't know if you remember, but about two years ago in Queensland, they had one of those floods and over 100,000 cattle died. They were, you know, the water was all six foot deep. Cattle were washed up against the fences and they died. Okay, now go back to the gold mining rush era and you've got cattle on the more lush land behind the mountain range. You know, the gold mines are on the coast and the, the cattle are inland. They are shipping the cattle in to feed the miners. So that's the ranching area. Now, there's no telecommunications, no roads, no everyone's on horseback and this 100 year flood comes along and the records are there, they show it. Well, the flood killed all the cattle, all the ranchers, everything died. One flood. Okay, now in a brittle environment, over rest kills grass. So now you've got no animals to keep the grass that grows after the flood alive. So now it starts to desertify from over rest. Now the few cattle that do get shipped back because all those ranching families and all that land is gone and all the fences are gone, you can't ranch there. So they ship the cattle over the mountain to the coastal area. And that is what we've rebuilt the California ranching herd with in this next century. So we basically overrested the land behind the desert for a hundred you know, hundred years because we didn't know about the damage that overrest does in a brittle environment. So, and the more we overrest it, the bigger the desert's gonna get. So yes, you are correct. Historically, it was a healthy grassland, but first we killed the bison. And then we had a few cattle, then they died in a bad flood. The infrastructure and the ranching families got destroyed. And it was so long ago that you know, no one communicated, but 
the regeneration with a small herd of cattle that could get shipped to California happened along the coastal plain. And the longer we had no cattle behind the mountain range, the worse the desert became. Mm. To where now only my biological carpeting project can now heal it. It's now got so bad. Yeah, and then also um, I guess the Owens Lake, they uh, on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada, they funnel all that water to LA and San Diego. So it's drying out that whole eastern side of California south. Well, eastern. you know, that's a fairly minor problem, um, and and I'm I'm going to get myself in trouble here, but I need to tell people the truth. Bare soil has 84% evaporation. Covered soils have 10% evaporation. So if your land management policies are guaranteeing that all your national forests have no cattle in and are creating more and more bare soil from over rest, then you guarantee to lose 84% of your precipitation to evaporation, only leaving 10% with the potential to flow into your dams and lakes to feed the cities. Our policies are guaranteeing that we run out of water. Mm. Because in the 90s, there was cattle free by 93. We believed cattle were eatable, so we got them all off all our federal and state land. The worst decision we've ever made. Absolute stupidity. Mm. So, so, so you're saying... Uh, applying your biological carpeting idea to parts of the, this uh, California that has these desert could actually restore parts of California's water, you know, would help with water scarcity in, in California. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you figure, you know, we want to do 150,000 acres a year. Once that's restored, that's more water going into the ground when it does rain. And, and I granted it's not high rainfall and it's not a lot, but it's more. It's cooler soil, so you don't have the hot air blowing into uh, San Diego and Los Angeles. Um, when cooler air is coming up off the desert, up to that escarpment, right now, such hot air blows up there, it prevents the clouds making it over the mountain. Once we've got cooler air if, you know, going up that mountain, now more clouds will get over. So you'll actually have an increase in rainfall. Currently, the rain can't get over the mountain. There are so many things connected. But it all starts with us doing the biological carpet at the Salton Sea and the surrounding area, fixing that 150,000 acres um, and then expanding and expanding and just keeping on going north. And basically from the Mexican border, just keep going north, you know, as we see, okay, we fix that, do the next bit, fix that, do the next bit. And most of it is owned by the state of California. So if the will is there, we, we can do it. Um, you know, uh, small payment for ecosystem restoration services. And I think 10 million people in Los Angeles will benefit and they will not believe how much of a change it will be, but it will be massive. I mean, you can't cool the soil temperature or the sand temperature by between 50 and 80 degrees per day through the summer. If you cool it by between 50 and 80 degrees per day, you there's no mathematical way you can tell me that that will not have a carryover effect into the Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. When I was looking at um, Milan, Milan, he was looking at the Spain because it's continental divide. Like he was saying, mm -hmm. if, since it's not bringing down as much of the moisture as it blows from one ocean to the other, that's yeah. causing you know loss of rains. And in the Sinai Desert, where they try to regreen it, they're saying the same thing. They can bring down the rain there, then it'll moisture hop. The rain will kind of yeah. from that small water cycle to neighboring. So I, when I, you know, when I did my interview with Tiers about regreening the Sinai, I was like, wait, is there a continental divide in the U.S.? And I was like, oh yeah, between the the uh, Pacific Ocean and the Gulf of California, you know, the 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 winds are blowing in. If we can bring down that moisture, then that could moisture could hop into the Colorado River and then feed a lot more of the whole Western United States with more water. And then it's, I heard him talking and I was like, wow, you're actually trying to do that thing, like try to. Really yeah, and I, I, I'm trying to do it without support. I mm. mean, I, you know, I'm three years now, I've been knocking my head against the wall saying, support me, support me, support me. Um, and, you know, basically I'm getting nowhere. Mm. And it just shows that I'm not very smart and not very good at networking and, you know, getting the financial guys to back me and the media to back me and everything but you know we've all got to have our flaws i'm a bushman i don't like people and i'm not a city person and i 
you know, I don't function well with humans, but I've got the knowledge of how to do it. I just, you know, I need, I need backers. But what you said is, is it's more amazing. So, um, you know, I, I, I did a lot of studying in university. I, I got quite well educated. And, and among the things I studied was geography, geology, and satellite imagery. So I'm really able to track these things down. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the waters that come up from Baja hit the Imperial Valley and stop. Now that water is meant to, if you look at the airflow channels, that water is meant to come up from, the, from Baja, up the Imperial Valley, and then there's a trade wind that's meant to cut it across Kansas, Texas, et cetera, et cetera. The droughts that they're having from Kansas and Texas are because the Imperial Valley is too hot. Mm. Could you just describe for the uh, listeners where exactly Imperial Valley is in the map? So Imperial Valley is, uh, there's a mountainside between San Diego and Arizona. And so you come uh, from San Diego, you go up over the mountain and the Imperial Valley is that next bit of land before the next mountain range in, uh, in Arizona. So there's this, uh, and it's between the Mexican border of, at Tecate um, and uh, goes all the way up to uh, Palm Springs. So it's Palm Springs to, to the Mexican border, um, and that's the Imperial Valley. It, do you have any idea if like a century or two centuries ago it was greener there, or what was it like? Uh, oh, no, uh, we have pollen records. <laughs> mm. There were willows, there were beavers, there were um, wow. uh, willows, beavers, uh, elm, uh, a type of elm. Yeah, it was a wet, it was a wet environment. But remember, I said humans have been destroying the ecosystem for millions of years. Remember only 38,000 years ago, and that's yesterday, there were mammoths at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. There were mammoths in Los Angeles. You know, so in, you know, in, in the geological time, that was yesterday. So humans have killed these megafauna. You know, so when the Spanish arrived, they said, oh, it's a desert, oh, it's awful, et cetera, et cetera, not realizing that it was the natives who had already killed out the elk and the buffalo and everything. And if you look at, along the California coastal area, you'll see prickly pear areas and oak areas. The oaks were the Native Americans' oak plantations. The prickly pears were their prickly pear plantations. Those two plants have, you know, 300 year life, you know, three, 500 year lives. Uh, white Americans haven't been here that long. Those are the original plantations from the Native Americans. Well, that shows they had agriculture. So they would have been salmon fish farming, you know, harvesting prickly pears, harvesting acorns, um, and hunting any buffalo or elk that they could have got. Um, the damage was done thousands of years ago. And then we try and say, oh, no, it was pristine. No, it wasn't. Humans have been destroying that coastline for an awful long time. Mm. And is there a reason you picked Imperial Valley as your place that you would like to regreen? Yes. I look for the worst of the worst. And I look for a long enough growing season that we can grow enough forage for the livestock with the irrigation that we can have year-round growth. Mm. So the Imperial Valley is below sea level. It's hot year-round. So we could grow the forage to feed more livestock to do the biological carpeting faster. You know, uh, Arizona will have winter, Utah will have winter, Texas will have winter, New Mexico will have winter. The Imperial Valley, we've got a year round summer. So we can do the, we can get the most bang for our buck the quickest there. It will do the most good. It will get the most positive publicity because you've got the Hollywood right there. Um, so it, you know, when I made my checklist of all the things I was looking for, that is the, if you're going to target one spot to have the most, the lowest hanging fruit, the worst of the worst to begin with, um, and fix the uh, and have and have the fix do the greatest good. That's it. Mm. And how does it impact that it's right next to the Salton Sea? So basically, um, you know, I believe if we can get all the ground around the Salton Sea covered, and we can have the rivers start to flow into the sea again. Um, you know, I think we can slow down, if not halt the evaporation. Um, you know, right now more water evaporates than flows in. I think we can probably get it back to where it at least stabilizes. Um, and I can't say how I'll do it, but I actually do have a plan to actually 
increase it as well. Mm, oh, interesting. So just for the listeners, the salt and sea, it, that, it, like there was actually a big leakage, right, in aqueduct in the early 1900s that created this. 1930s, they created the lake by uh, a breach in the dike in the Colorado River. So the Colorado River flowed in, created the lake, and then they it took them like seven years to fill the breach. And then once they filled the breach, then that was all the water that was there. Yeah. Yeah, and then the Hollywood, everyone was vacationing there, but now it's slowly drying up and leaving all this residue. No, no. So it increased the dry, salty shoreline, stinking dry, dry salty shoreline increases by 30,000 acres a year. Mm. It's not slow. It's drying up. So, so your idea is to kind of create almost like a small water cycle where you're creating more rain and it flows back in and keeps that lake or sea kind of uh, full. Okay, yeah. cool. And yeah, yeah, now deal with all the respiratory issues that everyone's dealing with out there. Yeah, it would, you know, 70, sorry, between 70 and 80% of the children in the valley have asthma. Mm. So how big of a plot are you looking for in the Imperial Valley? Um, how many acres? So to begin with, for the first couple of years, just to prove concept, train staff and get up and running, we want five to 6,000 acres. And then within three years, we want an agreement with the Californian government. Once we've shown that it's working, we want, uh, basically to fix 150,000 acres a year. Okay. And then how many cattle would you be bringing in for this? So to begin with, yeah, we start, um, you yeah, know, start with a couple of thousand cattle, train the staff, get a few more. Um, but yeah, kind of the, the beginning 5,000 acre thing, I think we're talking uh, between 20 and 30,000 cattle to begin with. When we get up to 150,000 acres, it'll be 600,000 cattle. Okay. At any one time. Now, understand that that's truckloads of cattle arriving every day and truckloads of cattle leaving every day to be processed in Brawley at the Meatworks to be sold into Los Angeles as organic, grass finished, pasture raised local beef. And then, how does the rotational grazing, the holistic management work? How often do they graze in one area and then move to the next? So, once the biological carpet's done, cattle are removed. Okay then we have to allow for the regeneration to occur and basically what we're doing there is we wait for the rainfall so if we have another seven year dry period we'll wait seven years but if it rains every year for the next seven years if we're going into an el nino uh, cycle then you know forage will grow immediately once the forage is growing, then we do holistic planned grazing with a breeding herd of mother cows that are then perpetually there for all time into eternity to maintain the grassland ecosystem. And they are, uh, and then we do them to a holistic grazing plan, and they might graze once in one or two years, depending on what the rainfall is. After in many deserts, we have a two year recovery period before we graze again. But when they're grazing, they're grazing at a million pounds per acre. So they're shoulder to shoulder, churning things up, lots of dung, lots of urine, invigorating things, um, you know, really stirring things up, graze it, but then the land gets a long, long recovery period. Mm. And that's how we maintain grassland ecosystems in desert environments. And do you also bring in chickens in this environment the, the chickens will be there during the biological carpeting for the role they do of spreading the, the things and then uh, chickens are used at water points with the grazing herd just to keep tick burden and worm burden down at the water points and then the rest of the land generally the cattle egrets and the ox peckers and all the other birds take over their their traditional role of keeping the the land clean on a bigger scale and then do trees and larger plants grow naturally or do you have to plant the seeds or do they naturally come in from the birds and animals? Um, so we will, be plant, uh, we will be feeding the livestock tree seeds mm. so that the seeds go through the acid in the intestine, uh, softens the seed, and then the seed lands in a big old cow patty and that's the perfect uh, germinating greenhouse for it. And the tree seeds will germinate in the cow patties and 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 grow and do their own thing. Oh, wow. So yes, we will be doing a lot to encourage it to very quickly go from a grassland ecosystem to a savanna ecosystem. Okay. And the grass that the cows eat, where is that being grown? 
So, uh, so the Imperial Valley, where uh, the 6,000 acres that we initially identified for the site, but you know, I think we've lost it to an energy company who wants to put up solar panels. But if we can get it back, we'll find another you know, chunk of land. Um, the Imperial Valley has a north and a south irrigation farmed area um, where people currently grow hay that they sell to China. So we will have them grow our specially formulated biological forage mix and we'll pay them and they won't have to export their product to China. They'll have a guaranteed market. They'll grow forage for us, uh, ship it 30 minutes by truck to the herd in the desert. The herd will eat it, defecate it out, and, um, and then they'll regrow more forage. And that's why we like the Imperial Valley because they can grow forage year round. Mm. So they don't have to stop because of winter. Yeah. So as a kind of uh, the marketing strategy, like it seems like one of them is like to increase California's water supply or the Western US's water supply. Uh, is that one of the ways you're trying to promote this or is there different strategies you're trying to sell this project? Look, how, if, how if, I knew, if I knew what I was doing three years ago, I would have had the $100 million I'm looking for. Mm. When I find the right financial team, I will take their advice. Yeah. Yeah. Do people want help with climate change? Do they want help with cooling Los Angeles? Do they want help with um, fixing the water cycle for the rest of the United States? Do they want carbon sequestration? Do they want uh, healthy meat for the school children of Los Angeles? Do they want local environmentally sound climate change fighting you know, meat? Do they, you know, what do people want? I, I believe people want everything. What will they put their hands in their pockets to get? Mm. That's out of my wheelhouse. I know cows, shit, grass, fungus. I don't know financial markets. So you're saying it affects, how would you say it affects the climate? The, what's the, let's say we can regreen a lot of the Imperial Valley. How would that affect the climate in California? Uh, categorically, there'll be more moisture in the air. The air will be cooler. You'll have uh, less droughts, less uh, Chinook winds, less dust storms, mm. uh, less fires um life will literally just be better you, right. you'll have less of the extremes you'll have a more mediocre because right. right now you've got extreme heat extreme cold extreme heat extreme cold that causes a much greater fluctuation if you've got soil covered with uh, organic matter the heat in the middle of the day doesn't get that hot the heat at right. night doesn't get that cold so you have a much more stable ecosystem and environment right so it seems like, you know, you know, there's multi billion dollars thrown at the whole fire issue. So like, this is like a kind of approach that's coming from left field that people haven't seen, but maybe that's one area to target. And then also the water scarcity, you know, multi billion dollar issue. So that's another area to target. And then also, maybe there's ways to, we need to get this into the climate conversation, you know, the heating globe, you know, the global warming thing, yeah. like there's ways to kind of approach that. Um, so and that's why so, I'm doing this podcast with you. Yeah. Go get them. Do you want to say your um, website where how people can reach you? Uh, fixeddeserts.com. Okay. Fixeddeserts.com. Okay. We'll put that. And in then show. on, on that page, we have a subscribe button. Um, if you could subscribe, we're trying to get up to, you know, 60 to a hundred thousand subscribers just so that we have more clout when we go to the governor of California and we say, look, all these people want us to do it. Can you help? So if you could tell friends, family, everyone you know, everyone who's passionate about the environment and looking for real solutions. And I, I'm talking real solutions. I, I'm not interested in band-aids or let me get rich um, playing this, uh, you know, playing people for fools. This is a real solution. Right. So, so, and so that, and, and so how would you say the return on, on investment? So there's also the cattle that can be, uh, sold for, for, for beef. So, that's a, that's a part so, of the initial return on investment. You know, there are so many ways that investors will make money. Mm. So let's say we buy land for $2,000 in the desert per acre. That's blowing sand. Well, what's land, good ranch land worth? That's got black soils, pronghorn, elk, deer, quail, ground cover. Well, that's mm. selling for between ten and $30,000 an acre. So we've got a land play with several hundred percent oh, wow. we've got a life we've got we've got a livestock play because we buy in a cow for eight hundred a thousand dollars we turn around and sell it as meat for eight thousand dollars 
So that's a meat play. We've got a carbon sequestration if we can come up with agreements to keep the carbon in the soil for 100 years. That's a carbon play. We've got a water sequestration, you know, ecosystem services with the government for all this water sequester. That's a water play. Um, uh, yeah, we've got a real estate development, you know, 500 acre ranchettes with $10 million homes on them, you know, less than two hours from Los Angeles. We've got a real estate play. We've got a lot of plays, but personally, I don't care about which play it is. I just know we have to do it. You know, and if greed is what gets humans to want to do it, fantastic. You'll make your money back, but let's just do the job. Right. And for three years, I've been saying this and no one's listening. So we need people to put their hands in their pockets. We need financial advisors to say, this is how we're going to float it on the stock exchange. You know, we need people to, to, to help. You know, I have my skill set. My skill set is not Wall Street. My skill set is not the financial markets. I'll probably piss more financial people off because I'll show them that I'm autistic in mathematics and I think about things that people don't even think about. But my goal has never been about money. I, I own an 18 and a half thousand acre ranch. I can go home and be happy and rich. Mm. This work I'm doing is way beyond me. This is trying to save humanity. Yeah. So in, in California, there's a lot of money in Silicon Valley because of all the tech stuff. And uh, some of these companies are getting very interested in, you know, restoration and climate change. And so if any of the listeners on this podcast, like if you know of a connection, um, because they probably would like to invest in something that's going to help the California climate. Um, yeah. Let, reach out to you. It's let, let once more your website. Let's, let's uh, fix, 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 fix desert or fix uh, deserts. Uh, we did it in both.com and then hit subscribe. Okay, cool. Thank you Great. for your time. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a good day. Cool. All right. Ciao.